So the way I was trained in, in school, right. To think about this is as, as like separate continents, right. So North and South America, um, which is actually not the norm. So if you go to schools in, in Colombia or Venezuela or Paraguay, they learn that this is one continent called America, which is the first answer. One of you all said, um, so you're all, you're all already thinking more like, uh, Latin Americans see this region, right? This land mass. Um, it's it, geographically, right? There's a, you know, there's a canal built there in Panama, but really it's all one land mass. Um, the Isthmus of Panama connects all the way through, right? Um, and so in, in Latin American schools, they learn that there's, this is one continent. Um, but naming is really important when we think about the region that we live in, right? This hemisphere is another way to think about it. Some people will call this the Western hemisphere, even though technically like most of Ireland and the UK and Western Africa is actually part of, uh, part of the Western hemisphere, it gets kind of split up, but you can use that terminology as well. Whereas, like I said, in, in Spanish and Portuguese, you're going to hear people say America. This is just, this is America. It's all America. And so when, if you've ever been abroad uh, visiting Argentina or wherever, and you're like, oh, soy americano, if you say that, they're going to say, yo también, me too, right? We're all, we're all American. You're, you're, estadounidense, you're United Statesian is the, the Spanish and Portuguese way of saying it. So it's just interesting to think about the way we relate to the rest of our, and some people would say backyard, um, as, as many uh, statesmen in U.S. history would think about Latin America. And we'll talk in a second about that. Uh, but terminology, I think, is interesting and, and useful when we ask questions about what is Latin America and how does North America or Anglo America or the United States relate to this region, right, that's so close, so intimately tied historically through immigration, through interpolitical uh, dynamics, through economics, et cetera, right? And then this is the region that most of you would probably think of if I said Latin America, right? Uh, what is, what is, where does the word Latin come from in this terminology? Why do we call it Latin America? It's a 19th century invention, the term Latin America by a European scholar, um, but it's referring to the kind of romance languages, right? So in, in the opposition, the opposite of Latin America at that time was Anglo-America, which was the English speaking part, Canada and the United States and the British Caribbean. Um, and so the, you can see the kind of amorphous uh, categories that we have all these different ways of calling ourselves different Americans, but none of them are actually that clean, right? They are all have kind of these fuzzy boundaries. Um, so if Spanish and Portuguese uh, are part of, or, you know, the language, the, the countries that whose official language is Spanish and Portuguese, right, are part of Latin America, what do we do about Haiti? Right. So a lot of scholars of Latin America consider Haiti historically to be part of Latin America. Um, and so if that's the case, then what do we do about here? I'll go to one more image. What do we do about French Canada? Right. Or French Louisiana. Right. Like, I mean, Canada still has if you've ever been to Montreal. I drove up, I think, when I was 19 years old from my house in Massachusetts to go uh, celebrate New Year's. So I've been once and it, everything was in French. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize, you know, I didn't know, I wasn't a history, uh, interested in history at the time. Um, but why don't we consider French Canada to be part of Latin America if Haiti is, right? These are interesting kind of questions to problematize this concept in general of Latin America. Uh, so these are the British speaking countries and islands of the Americas. Where do they fit in, right? Some of them are still part of the Commonwealth. Some of them have become independent like Guyana. Uh, Belize, but they all have Jamaica have past uh, relations to Britain, just like the 13 colonies um, uh, on the eastern seaboard of North America. Uh, so again, another kind of complicating factor. Uh, there are uh, in South America, which is a term that a lot of people use to say when they want to say Latin America, they'll be like, yeah, South America. Well, South America is this subcontinent, right? But not all of this subcontinent fits well into the Latin America category. So French Guyana is part of France. It's part of literally part of France. It's part of mainland France or overseas France, but it's it's uh, part of the, the French nation. Uh, Guyana is an independent nation that was once uh, British. And then Suriname was once Dutch. The Dutch are another um, important colonial power that, that left its traces linguistically, culturally. Obviously, uh, New Netherlands in what is now New York was really important for a long time. But still today, people speak Dutch in the island of Curacao and in other parts of the Caribbean. Um, so these legacies, these colonial legacies are something that the Americas all share, right? 
Um, they all share these different kind of overlapping uh, but complicated and blurry lines of imperialism from British, uh, sorry, from European empires, right? And they overlap in all these really interesting ways. Um, so we talked about, so here, here's an, uh, a linguistic example. So if we think of Spanish being the most dominant language in the Americas as a whole and in Latin America, right, with Brazil being the main exception uh, with Portuguese, look at all of the Spanish speakers in the Western United States and in the cities and in Chicago and Florida, right? The United States has more Spanish speakers than Bolivia. The United States has more Spanish speakers than Spain, right? So are we part of Latin America? Is the United States part of Latin America, right? It certainly was uh, before the, the Mexican-American War, right? It's must, much of the West was part of Mexico and Spain before that, New Spain. Um, so all of these different questions kind of show us how not separate we are, right? I mean, if you lived where, where I used to live in, in Arizona, we were two hours from the border, but it was, you felt like you were in a Spanish speaking uh, country a lot of times and, and certain neighborhoods where you're, you're not necessarily so distant, right? You're not so far away uh, culturally, linguistically, or even geographically in many cases. Another way of thinking about the Americas and America as a whole as kind of sharing histories is to go back before the colonial period. So these are language groups in the Americas, right? North and South America here um, of the native peoples who have been here for tens of thousands of years speaking native languages, right? That in, in, there's all these fascinating bubbles. So on the left-hand side, you can see that big green spot that's over like what's now the Southwest and the Mountain West, Colorado. And then down again, that same color you can see in, in Western, Northwestern Mexico, Sonora, that actually goes down into Mexico where the Aztecs, so the Aztecs have a shared language group with the native peoples of the American Southwest, right? So Nahuatl and languages uh, that are spoken in the Southwest of the United States, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, share the same family because of migration patterns. Um, so there's all of these kind of shared layers, right? Um, in South America, there's all these different language groups that are still super important here in Peru, Quechua, is the most important language group uh, with uh, millions of language of Quechua language speakers. Um, so it's not just all of these colonial overlays, right? It's this underlying indigenous uh, societal, linguistic, cultural uh, bedrock that makes this part of the world, this half of the world or uh, third of the world's geography so unique and, and kind of more tied together than we think. Any questions? I told you I wasn't gonna lecture and now I'm lecturing, <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, the language groups are so fascinating. If you, you all, you're in Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. So the, all of the, I mean, Pennsylvania is just like New England in that the town names are so many of them are indigenous language names, right? So I used to live in Narragansett, Rhode Island, right? Named after the Narragansett tribe, which is still there. They're not in Narragansett anymore because it's desirable real estate. So they got pushed off to long, long ago to land that was less desirable. Um, but there's obviously still all these linguistic and cultural ties still, even in places like the Northeast where the where there's smaller native populations than in places like California or Arizona. And then the other, the other kind of way to think about the Americas and our shared past is the impact of enslaved people being brought to all of the region, right? You can see the, the different purple spots. Uh, Brazil received more slaves than the American South did. Um, the, the Caribbean, right? Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, right? All of those populations were you know, dramatically devastated by colonization, the native populations, and then repopulated with enslaved Africans. Um, and then places like Peru, places like Colombia, Venezuela, um, that you might not expect have big uh, black populations now and, and mixed race populations from the, the, the legacy of, of enslavement. Uh, now, when, when independence comes, almost every Latin American Republic frees its slaves as part of the call for independence. Um, some of the, sometimes it's to have fighters in places like Venezuela. They're like, we need you guys to fight with us. Um, but uh, but it was part of independence in a way that it was not uh, in what becomes the United States. Uh, and obviously, Haiti is its own unique case of uh, an enslaved population claiming and, and winning independence um, just a, you know, a half a generation after the United States does. Uh, but all of these legacies are so fascinating to me because you you might feel like if you've ever been to Brazil or if you've ever been to Uruguay or wherever, 
You might feel like, oh, this is such a different place. But in so many ways, the patterns that have made these nations uh, what they are is so similar because they're not the old nations of Europe that had kings and hereditary dynasties and thousands of years of linguistic and economic and cultural development in one place that was kind of like the French and the British hate each other for a million years, right? For I'm exaggerating, but for thousands of years. And it's like this, this American experiment is so unique uh, in human history. Um, and it brings people from all of the rest of the world. There's another wave after and people are enslaved, people are freed in, in Latin America. There's a huge immigration from China and Japan uh, of what were uh, derogatorily called coolie workers, right? So indentured servants. And there's a huge population of Japanese and Chinese. The, the president in the 90s here was Fujimori, a Japanese descended man. The food in, in Lima, for example, is a mix of like fusion of Japanese and uh, Andean food and Spanish food. So like there's all of these kind of waves that you you um, can kind of trace the kind of, you can you can take the the cultural makeup and the social makeup and political makeup of these countries and kind of follow it back to uh, obviously before the colonial period. Uh, now, my interest in religion always has me looking at like the role of the Catholic Church in Latin America as outsized as being really key to what makes Latin America what it is is this one of the things is this shared Catholic history, right? So being Catholic already is really unique when you're a citizen of a nation, because there's always these questions about who's in charge, the Pope or the president, right? Or the King, if, if you go back to European history, and there's always these kind of debates about where the rules should come from, where the political philosophies should come from. And in so many ways, the nations of Latin America drew on what are, is oftentimes called a kind of corporatism, an idea of uh, society working together as a body, right? So some people are the feet, some people are the legs, some people are the heads, some people are the hands, and they should all kind of stay where they belong so that the, the body as a whole can work the body politic. That general philosophy kind of animates legal and political thought in Latin America throughout the 19th century after independence, uh, whereas in the United States, kind of liberal uh, enlightenment ideas hold a more uh, central place, right? And you guys have all studied that, I'm sure. Uh, that's not to say that Bolivar and San Martin and the liberators of Latin America weren't influenced by kind of progressive liberal uh, ideas of politics. But if you look at the history of Colombia, Cuba, Mexico, El Salvador, you're going to find a lot more uh, instances of authoritarianism in uh, and what used to be called caudillos, right? A strong man leader uh, in the history of these countries. Whereas in the United States, it's a little bit harder to find that, right? The, the protection of the kind of terms of the voting as a kind of sacred right, all of that is a very U.S. American and then, uh, you know, uh, European model of liberalism, whereas in Latin America, there's kind of a little bit more of a regal, a royal, almost kind of like dating back to Spanish and, and uh, Portuguese colonial thinking kind of way of organizing politics and society. I'm going to stop talking. I thought I thought I was going to be able to ask good questions with these with these slides. But if any questions you have or I can go back to another slide if you have questions about any of these.